Uh, evening everyone, this, this won't be too long a talk, I did want to just kind of share uh, some of my excitement about this um, and possibly see if any of you are interested in getting involved if you may, if you may not know about it. Um, yeah, so what the, 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 I'll give you the kind of the background story on this. Uh, about three weeks ago, um, one of our guys who used to work for IBM um, was talking to one of his IBM friends uh, and they said, we're doing this thing Call call for code in the UNHCR headquarters in Geneva, uh, and we'd love to have some open source people there, kind of taking part. But one of your people uh, would like to attend, so he contacted a couple of us, and you know, before anybody had a chance, I was like, me, 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 me. Um, just uh, you know, I knew nothing about it other than I saw UNHCR, I saw Geneva. Um, <laughs> And I saw, I saw, you know, immediately after a little bit of reading, what it was about. So, Call for Code actually only started in 2018. Uh, there's this guy called David Clark who works with kind of NGOs and and people like the UN to do programs. So, uh, kind of general programs around technology and how technology can sort of be used for for good. Um, and what he did with Call for Code was he he kind of got together with IBM. IBM have have put in, I believe. 20 million over five years to kind of uh, do this. And it is literally that, call for code. It's, it's um, kind of uh, a call out to the, the worldwide development community to take your skills and apply them to certain problems um, that you know uh, those who could benefit from it uh, could do so. So I'll, I'll kind of walk you through what we were involved in, kind of how the whole thing worked, and then possibly um, you know, how you might get involved uh, were, there, just to give you a sense of time scales, there's a deadline of the end of July, or kind of 29th of July for this. So if you are interested in getting involved um, and taking part in some projects to do with this, you still have, you know, the guts of the month to kind of get, get your shit together. Um, so I decided to be brave and do this on my phone. Let's see how this works. So, uh, callforcode.org, if you, anybody who just wants to immediately go there and find out more about it. Um, as I said, the, the, the general idea was they wanted to do what I thought initially, based on the information we were given, was a hackathon uh, in Geneva, in, the, in what was, um, and I'll show you here, uh, the original League of Nations building uh, in, in, in Geneva, and is now the UN uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights kind of headquarters. Um, and this is where the hackathon was going to be. So any human is going to immediately jump on a plane and, and you know want to be here. Um, so huge excitement kind of going in here. You're, kind of, you're going into something very, very historic. This is called Palais Wilson. So Woodrow Wilson um, used to live here back in the day. Um, and you know, it was originally post-World War I, League of Nations. League of Nations collapsed, becomes the UN, um, and eventually kind of UNHCR. Um, but they said a hackathon. And, you know, one of the dangers of sending me to a hackathon is I'm not a, you know, a developer anymore. Um, so, you know, part of the thing you realise with this presentation is no code was harmed in the making of this, in this presentation. As anybody who's looked at my GitHub uh, would know, uh, lots of code has been harmed and I shouldn't be allowed anywhere near uh, code. But it actually turned out it wasn't that kind of hackathon. It was more of I, I suppose you call it an idea-a-thon. Um, so it was bringing people together from fairly disparate backgrounds, all technical, uh, or relatively technical, um, to come up with ideas that might be implemented by developers, by technical people, by technical teams coming together. Um, the 2018 event was hugely successful. You can read some stats there. 100,000 developers from 156 nations took part. Um, the project that won was amusingly, well, as soon as I heard, okay, you know, uh, sort of hackathon, UN, um, you know, you got, your brain jumps to Syria as an old sort of embedded software engineer, you go, oh, mesh networks, it'll be something, we can do something, and then it turns out that's what won last year. So um, what they did last year was they basically created, for those of you who have anything to do with Hackaday and hacking and hardware, throwies, so um, devices that have Wi-Fi and have a probably LoRa or something like that, 
that you would scatter all over a disaster area that gives people the ability to connect with their phone um, and get you know emergency information to and from. So basically, I'm here, I'm injured, uh, or I need help, I need rescuing. And basically, after after let's say a major hurricane or or, or, or whatever, they can just flood an area with these really cheap devices, just drop them everywhere, hang them on helium balloons, just get them wherever they go, drop them in rivers, uh, and as I said, just flood an area so that when all of your infrastructure is gone, um, you can somehow you know, give people the minimum amount of bandwidth to actually uh, uh, do something. So that was, that was 2018. Um, uh, you know, the call for code 2019, build the best technology solution to improve natural disaster preparedness, prepare, prepare, I can't even say it, response and recovery. So when we arrived, we were actually given four um, high level uh, projects, uh, which meant there was four teams created. Um, and the one that I, the team I was assigned to was this accountability and centrality of protection for affected populations. So for you know the rest of you, for everybody here, I had no idea what that meant either. Um, and I read the description and I still didn't really know what it meant. Um, because each of these is actually, they're, they're related, but they actually involve different people in the UN. So most people when they think about um, UN, UNHCR, disasters and so on, they think about the people who are there dealing with the disaster. They're dealing with the humanitarian crisis that has occurred uh, with people needing water and food and, you know, all of uh, shelter, you know, all of those emergency related things. But the UN obviously does a huge amount more than that. And particularly when you think about UNHCR, their human rights office is entirely, you know, in parallel to, to that sort of emergency stuff. And they're focused on human rights. So you're, the things that can happen to people post um, you know, emergencies happening where their, their rights are being infringed upon. Now that may be by people in their own locality, uh, it might be by the state, I mean, if you think about somewhere like Syria, um, it might even be in the worst case scenario by the people who are supposed to be helping them. So um, that, it turns out, was effectively what our um, team was about. It wasn't about, you know, um, emergency you know, notification systems or anything like that. It was actually about specifically about human rights and what you can do to um, help. And, and, and the, the, the really important bit for us and for anybody who's thinking of getting involved in this, and if you walk away with nothing else uh, on this, it was listening to um, us, listening to the UN subject matter experts because you know, I said it in the blog post about this. You walk in, a bunch of tech people, we know loads about tech. You go, oh, here's a problem. We can solve that with tech, you know. So it's done in Kruger, just uh, immediately kicks in. You know nothing about the problem space. Uh, all you know is we can apply tech to this and everything will be so much better. Um, but then you actually listen to the subject matter experts and you realize uh, it's not a clean sheet of paper. And that's the really, really important thing. They're working under very specific uh, limitations. I think that's probably the best way of describing it. Um, take Syria. There's no UN feet on the ground in Syria. There, there, there just can't be. They're in Jordan. You know, most of them are in Jordan. So you can't say, well, if we if we're in Syria, we could have a, you know a, a fleet of drones or whatever. Stuff like that isn't isn't feasible for these types of scenarios, and particularly for human rights. That works in a really, really strict legal framework. This isn't a case of somebody saying, you know, hey, you know, help, my rights are being infringed, somebody go put that person in prison. The example we were given was actually um, Guatemala, where the former president, and I believe one of the former senior uh, military people, has just been, you know, done for want of a better legal term um, by the International Criminal Court. But that took 30 years. So it took 30 years to go from these people did you know committed atrocities to these people are now you know in jail or, or heading that way. So the the really strong message we were given by the particularly by the HRO people was you can't come along with a bunch of technical solutions to replace what we're doing because we do what we do because that's the way we have to do it. You know this, this these are the the limitations within which we work. And similarly, because they work in parallel with emergency workers. They can't expect emergency workers to be doing their job. So, you know, one of the examples they gave was um, you can't, 
you know, have emergency workers actively looking and seeking out human rights abuses, because if they start reporting and making a big deal about this stuff, they may be exited from the situation by the local, you know, power base that is there. So they have to be very, very careful that, you know, the right people from the right parts of the organization are, are doing all of this. And that really resonated with us that we couldn't just say, right, we can just implement some system that allows people to report human rights abuses, because that's kind of where your brain will go. Um, you know, that's, that's what we'll do and it'll be great and, and they can get rid of all these delays and paperwork, because, you know, immediately, oh, is there a lot of paperwork involved? We could fix that with forms. That's, you know, that, we, we went away from that very, very quickly when that was explained to us. So just to give you a, a hint as kind of a sense of, like our team had somebody from Lloyds Bank, from Deutsche Telekom, from IBM and me. Um, and Chris Ferris, I think, from IBM was particularly interesting. Like that, he's you know, the IBM fellow. This guy's involved in um, Hyperledger and blockchain and all of that. Amusingly, um, you know, I went in and I saw a lot of blockchain kind of mentioned uh, <laughs> across the site and, and over my dead body, are we doing something with blockchain um, on this project? And then I get introduced to Chris, and I thought, this is Chris, he works in hyperledger. Um, and Chris turns around and goes, over my dead body, is blockchain going to be used on that project? So I knew I was going to like him immediately. Um, so, um, as I said, we uh, listened and listened and listened and listened to, to what um, we were told by the subject matter experts. And, you know, separate from our project, one of the other people who spoke, uh, I think it's Chris Fish, Chris Fish, Adam Fish, um, he's more focused on, um, you know, that sort of uh, the emergency <coughs> side of things, and particularly around stats and data and, and, um, and so on. And he made the very good point that data tends not to be a problem for them. So, for example, with hurricanes, they know the hurricane's coming. They know where the hurricane's probably going to hit. They probably know how many people are going to die, how many people are going to be displaced. That's not the problem. The problem is people won't move. People know the hurricane's coming, and they will not move until the roof is ripped off their house and they're actually forced to move. So there's no point in building, you know, uh, solutions which are all about sort of like a, a, you know, emergency, a hurricane is coming. They, they already have all of that stuff. Um, so those aren't the problems to be solved. There's other problems that, you know, you can apply tech to um, where they, you know, they don't have the ability to, to do stuff. So, what we came up with was, and this is, as I said, this wasn't implemented, this is concept, um, and the, the, the idea behind these four concepts was, you know, we created these over the space of two days, they then got presented out at various events that IBM's involved in, at a virtual hackathon and so on, and it's basically, you can use one of these. So you can say, I want to work on that, and kind of either put together a team or offer to be part of a team that implements you know, one or more of these, uh, or you can just ignore them. They're really just seeds. They're basically saying, here are our four ideas. Um, they're based on talking to UN people, so you know, they sort of short-circuited a lot of the process for you if you don't have access to those UN people. Um, but you absolutely don't have to do any of these. It's just, you know, here's four, see what you think. Um, so what we came up with was, you know, it was done as kind of a, a design workshop, we'll say. Um, you know, standard personas, you know, uh, problem solving, but particularly around personas. And what we ended up with were, were, were two personas. So fundamentally, you know, the victim, um, you know, Amira 14. Um, and what we tried to do was hit, you know, a lot of the extreme cases, so a lot of the extreme scenarios. You know, we use Syria there, the other option was the, the Rohingya coming out of uh, Myanmar into Bangladesh and so on, who have a, a, a whole other uh, set of challenges, including things like, you know, a, a massive proportion of them are, are not literate. And in fact, they, they only had a written language, a real written language since about 1982, I think. <clears throat> Syria, uh, the, you know, very specific problems there. Um, one of the, the people we talked to was um, very focused on, uh, you know, one of the big problems they have in these situations is, I'll uh, probably get the acronym wrong, so it's, uh, so it's sex and gender based so it's violence. So it's violence against women, uh, young, young women, uh, kids, that, that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, we, 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 as I said, you know, amputee, humanitarian crisis in, in, in Syria, um, 
and bad things are happening around human rights. So not, not necessarily around, you know, obviously bombing and all of that, that's horrific, but it's not the, it's not the problem we're trying to address. They are, we're, we're trying to address the, the human rights issue. So we asked ourselves, if a person is trying to report human rights abuses, just think of the amount of trouble they could get in if that was found out. Like something at, 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 at as, as simple a level as that. So you try and send a text message, but the state controls the telecoms network. So they're, you know, they can be filtering all of this stuff. Saying, oh, I see you're reporting that our soldiers are, you know, doing human rights abuses, and that's that's the end of you. So we became very, very focused on the issues around somebody having the ability to report that there's a problem without it causing them further problems. Um, but that isn't, um, and back to the original point I made about kind of the legal framework, that's not to say person reports problem, problem goes into some system, and we, don't have to, we won't worry about the implementation details yet, problem goes into some system, UN is notified, you know, it, it isn't UN gets on white horse and goes and saves this person, all they can use that as is a signal, and if they get another signal from the same area, and another signal from the same area, and another signal, then they go, we may have an issue here that we as an organization have to go and investigate. Now, the thing is, if it is a, an open society situation, so let's say somewhere like, like, like Haiti, they possibly know about it already. So, the, you know, this type of thing may not be necessary in many cases, simply because there's open communications going on, um, and they just know, that either via locals, via, via you know, local um, mayors or, or people in power, they know stuff's happening, and they're trying to deal with it. This is more dealing with those cases where they simply don't. They don't know because they don't have access, um, or there's communications issues, or there's language issues where they're actually not aware that there may be problems happening. So we decided to, to try and create something that was that, was around, well, it was around two things. We got, you know, we had feature creep within about two hours. So we come up with our original concept and then we immediately exploded. Um, but the, the original concept was give people the ability to report that there's a problem in a way that keeps them safe um, and in a way that is used as an input into the existing system, does not replace the existing system. It's just an add-on that says, you might be thinking about looking here because you've just got a bunch of signals where uh, you know somebody's reporting problems. But we then took a step back and went, well, the thing is, that's great, but maybe we could do more, really, if, if we're implementing something like this that allows people to communicate, maybe they could communicate more. And then we turned it into stories. And then the, the idea became, let people tell their stories. It doesn't have to be about human rights abuses. It may involve human rights abuses. Because the, 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 the problem we ran into is, if you're doing this on mobile, you know, what, if your phone has an app on it called Human Rights Abuses UN, you're immediately causing problems for yourself. Um, so, and it can't be a website, because it, if, unless you've got some way of doing VPNs and so on, again, people will know you're doing that. But if you've got an app called Telling My Story, or My Story, or Stories, or you know, Twitter 2.0, or whatever you want to call it, where it's just people saying stuff, um, and then you know, in your back end, whatever your back end is, you're just scanning for keywords, trigger words, patterns, trends, um, you know, you're applying ML, you're, you're applying all these things that let you know it looks like there might be an issue there in these stories people are telling you. So that's the, the kind of the, the core idea there was let people tell stories, those stories may contain human rights abuse issues, uh, see if we can flag that. And then if it's possible, take, you know, bifurcate the data effectively. So on one side you've got signals going to UN saying we think there is stuff happening here. You know, that information is, is identifiable in the sense of there, there may be PII in there for GDPR people um, and location information. Then, you know, have another stream of data which is effectively the public stream. So, you know, the, the, a simplified, stripped down, um, filtered um, uh, archive of these people's stories in their own language. So that's what we came up with. It sounds, it sounds reasonably big, but we, we, we actually thought um, you know, it's not, it, it could actually be done relative, relatively quickly. Um, 
I talked a second ago about the Rohingya. So one of the things we want, we, we were very um, cognizant of was literacy. Um, so it's you know it's fine if you're if you're you know a huge number of people in Syria who were you know have been displaced or middle class people, highly educated people. Rohingya not so much. Um, so one of the things we were looking at was potentially the ability to do speech to text on device. And um, so all you know one, you know that classic one giant button as your app that basically press the button, talk, you're done, data gets encrypted, on device immediately, text gets sent somehow, we'll get into that in a minute, um, and there's no ability for anyone to ever know you sent that message, what that message contained, what you said, and so on. Now, having said, you know, that's great for Rohingya, there are no speech to text uh, tools for the Rohingya language. So, you know, that, that's the extreme case, but that's, there's a challenge for somebody to do that, to start building the kind of the corpus uh, around, um, you know, voice, the, the speech models and so on for those languages. Um, but basically, well, uh, one of my contributions to this was uh, for any of you who's aware of, S I don't know how many of you, are. how many people in the room are aware of SSB, Secure Scufflebot? What I knew him, but I just knew him. Because <laughs> he works for us. Um, imagine, just take a drink. So some of you, if you're out, Node developers may be aware of Dominic Tarr. So Dominic Tarr is one of the original legends of, of Node.js. You know, at one stage had written more Node modules than anyone else on the planet. Uh, brilliant programmer. Um, lives on a boat off the coast of New Zealand. Uh, so therefore doesn't have continuous access to the internet. Um, likes communicating, likes having you know a friend network, a, an online friend network. Can't really use Twitter, Facebook, and obviously for other reasons, not using Twitter and Facebook, you know, the hate machines that they are. Um, so created with others, a uh, secure scuttlebutt. Um, this is basically, you know, a, a social network in inverted commas that is designed around intermittent access to uh, connectivity. Um, and is peer to peer in the sense of, you know, if there's if there's you know, five people connected to the network, you can get your message, you know, via each other. Um, does have servers as such, but it's not centralized servers. They can pop up and down. So it's a very, it's a completely decentralized uh, or very decentralized. I won't say completely decentralized system. Um, and it appears it might be suitable for this. And that's, that's literally all I, I wanted to suggest with SSB. It might be a su suitable technology for people who are in areas who may not have full-time internet access, um, who need something that's encrypted, who need something where a government can't just block all the servers and suddenly the system, you know, let's say uh, Turkey or Sri Lanka or wherever, shut down Twitter, they shut down Facebook and suddenly you've no access. So, you know, peer-to-peer -peer is, is pretty important there. Uh, the one downside of SSB that we discovered is um, its, it's key implementation appears to be a blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that just was not what I expected at all. Um, and I ended up being the person who suggested a technology that's based on blockchain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, it, it, it's not, and the reason that we have SSD type network there is SSD on its own, out of the box, is not suitable for what we're talking about but it's kind of core tenants, a lot of the code might be, and the reason I'm speaking of Node.js is obviously it's written in Node.js by one of the, you know, as I said, le legends of Node.js. Um, so it might be worth looking at. Um, now, when we did the, the um, uh, kind of original analysis on this, one of the questions was, well, are we limiting ourselves by saying we, this is going to be an app, in inverted commas, uh, who does that exclude? So, you know, we, we, and then we went and looked, 90% of the world's population has a phone, 80% uh, of the world's population has some sort of smartphone, and we kind of ran with that, but I'm actually going to rewind on that at the end a little bit and, and talk about sort of uh, expanding that out. Um, but we felt it was a reasonable compromise because, you know, effectively what else would they use like if, you, if you're going to communicate it has to be some sort of communications device and, and a phone seems like a, a reasonable uh, way to do that um, as I said the stream being split in two um, there's a lot of stuff hidden here 
you know, this, this is the hard bit. Um, so stripping, filtering, making sure there's no PII going out and creating this public archive, that's probably um, regional rather than, let's say, town-based, because again, you know, could you infer who has written something, because this is all obviously going to be anonymized, uh, who has written something based on, you know, where, where, where a particular um, story came from. Um, but the, the, the bit we think is, is really doable is scanning for things like keywords and so on and getting that to some sort of dashboard to, um, to, to the UN and to those H, um, HRO people who are deeply non-technical as they pointed out to us. So whatever is done here has to be just, you know, absolutely, you know, you, UX is just right up number one thing you have to get right here. If this is just a constant stream of noise, it won't get used. But if there's a way of, you know, flagging, we have seen, let's say, a hundred different signals, whatever those signals are, that there's something going on around here. That, that is a, as a single signal then to a human rights person going, okay, may, maybe we should be looking and, and finding out more because that's, that's all this is. This is a, an indication that they may need to go and, and find out more. This was, um, you know, empathy maps for, for that, that, that person. Things like, you know, I can't trust people. You know, here we go again, there's another, you know, there's another issue. Please tell me that's not right. Um, and, and trust, it became for, for, with all of this, remains a challenge. And, and we mentioned it at the end. Um, how do you convince people that this thing that you want to create and you want them to use and you want them to use to report problems, um, or you know, in a broader sense, uh, isn't going to cause them to get shot. Um, and that's a big ask. So there's, there's, there are definitely challenges there. Um, the other, I, I won't go, go, the other persona was Elsa, who's actually it's the real name of the person who told us all about the Human Rights Office. So Elsa Lepinek. So, so it was, what are the challenges they have, and particularly, you know, how can we help rather than, you know, try and replace or, 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 or supplant what they're doing? How can we just feed into that? Um, so a lot of this was just from the conversations with her um, and how we could uh, possibly help. I won't go into that. Uh, as you can see, design is, is one of my top um, capabilities in their form. Um, we really do think uh, uh, you know, a, a, a two-entry system on, on some sort of app. So text box, you know, like classic Twitter 2006, 2007, or, you know, more like a, a Google Assistant um, mi microphone. But again, think UX, what does the microphone icon mean to people in certain situations and so on. So there's, there's lots of stuff you can do with, it, with two simple inputs there. Um, and then the kind of the, 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 the other side of that is the, the feedback out, which may never happen, even if this system was implemented. You know, this was definitely a, a, a V2.0, um, but we still think has value because if you are from a somewhere where your story has never been told, and I keep jumping back to the Rohingya, even though they're the most difficult situation uh, scenario to describe, but a, a friend of mine, I uh, actually used to work for UNHCR. I was in Bangladesh, and he pointed out the second you know people got across the border, it was phones and SIMs, because that's how you communicate, and that's how people communicate with each other. Um, and it's it, it critically important. So if, that, if those devices are getting into their hands, their story does need to get told. It, it can't stay limited to you know, uh, giant organizations telling their story on their behalf. Uh, you know, I, I think it, it, it's on us to make sure that they can, they can tell their own story. Um, one of the things we had to do as part of the event was sort of recommend um, IBM technology. So just to, just to explain how the whole uh, system works, if you want to take part at all, you go to call for code, you say, I want to take part, you sign up. You, you sign up for an IBM developer account, obviously it's totally free. Um, I think if you're taking part, you get free credits for loads of different cloud services. And you know, ideally they want you to use some, some I, IBM services. You don't, absolutely don't have to, but lots of them are applicable. You know, NLP, um, speech to text, sentiment analysis, um, you know, there's lots of stuff there. Uh, and then, as we're saying, um, there's, you know, what open source could be used. So there's plenty to be done around time series databases and all that sort of stuff. Um, and then from an SSB perspective, if that ended up being the appropriate technology, there is lots of 
small little projects around it. So something like Manyverse, which is based on it, you know, they have an Android app. I don't know if they have an iOS app, but they do have an Android app, uh, and it's open source. So you could easily go along and kind of use that as a, as a basis. Now, I did say uh, while I was there, and I may, I may have been a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for, optimistic, but I did feel that, if you, you know, the V1.0, um, for mainstream languages um, could be very, very, very quickly implemented as a, as a proof of concept. So just a you know, kind of hackathon level proof of concept because all the building blocks are there, all of the cloud services are there, you know, it's just a wiring up exercise. Um, but you know, compared to some of the other projects that were suggested by others, and I'm not trying to big us up, but in the sense of, it, ours felt very achievable, very doable, and we were very focused on, but if somebody was to do a hackathon tomorrow, could they actually build a chunk of this? And, and we, we did feel that, that they could. Um, that's SSB there. Uh, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't need to look this up, the scuttlebutt was basically the water uh, barrel on, a, a, on old ships where they used to you know, uh, get, get their water, and it's, it, it's where they, it was the original water cooler. So it was the original chat place. So this is a scuttlebutt, it's a secure way of people chatting to each other. And funnily enough, the protocol that's used, uh, or the basis for the protocol that's used, is called a gossip protocol, which in itself is kind of nice, kind of like the, the language around that. Um, open questions, I, I, I won't go through those, but basically it, it, a lot of it was around the, the personal security of the people who were attempting to do make use of this tool. I mean, that was, that was the biggest thing. Uh, we were focused on. And obviously you get to the end of the two days and you look at each other and you go, did we just reinvent Twitter? Um, so there's that. Um, we don't think so because this is not a hate machine and can't turn into a hate machine because fundamentally it's all going to the UN and all coming back out from the UN. So it is not a free for all, anybody can say anything, they can say anything, but it's not like the rest of the world is going to see it. It has a purpose uh, and, 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 and a, you know, a good purpose a uh, well-intended purpose, uh, rather than you know, do whatever you want and it'll all work out fine. Uh, and as we know, that didn't happen. Um, and then, this I added afterwards. So I actually added this uh, today, just this slide, which was back to the addressable market thing. Um, so yes, 90% of the world has phones. 80% um, of the world has um, smartphones. But there's billions of people, there's literally, because the, these stats, you hear that, and then you hear, well, there's over a billion people who don't have phones. So um, if you look at what's happening, particularly in India and sub-Saharan Africa and so on, people aren't, but they are buying Android phones. Those who can afford Android phones are buying Android phones, but those who can't are buying KaiOS phones. So uh, for any, again, people who are into this stuff, so KaiOS, um, operating system basically built from the, the embers of the failed Firefox uh, OS phone. Um, so Android AOS piece, Android open source, stripped, completely stripped back uh, um, under, under the hood. And then effectively web apps on top, um, but targeted at really, really low powered devices. So this company called KaiOS came along and said, you know, we think we can build something for, for um, I, I, third world is, is not the right phrase just for you know at the really really low end of the market and, and address as they say the next billion so getting the next billion online um, so the average KaiOS phone from people like Jio uh, and companies like that is about $20 uh, US unsubsidized so that's you know in your hand $20 phone which is still a lot of money uh, for you know sub-Saharan Africa um, but in some places they've got it down to 10 a little bit of subsidy going on, but they're, they're getting it down to ten dollars for a phone. And you say to yourself, well, you know, what the hell can you do with a ten dollar phone? So after we, we did this, I actually said, I, I had this thought. I said, you know, did we limit ourselves? Maybe we should kind of look at, well, could a KaiOS phone do this? Could that be good enough? Um, so I did a little bit of googling, and then of course I remembered. Uh, the banana phone is back. So Andy, for, for you old folks and for younger people, you have no idea. So uh, Matrix 1999, 20 years ago, this year. Um, so that's the banana phone. That's, it, it's Nokia in inverted commas. It's HMD uh, who bought the Nokia brand. So that's 
28 pounds sterling delivered Amazon Prime uh, for a phone that spec wise is awful for anybody who has you know, a Huawei P30 Pro, which will soon be useless. Um, <laughs> Oh, so, 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 so. <laughs> I was so looking forward to that phone. Um, so spec-wise, it's like I think half a gig of RAM, gigahertz processor, 240 by like 140 screen or something that doesn't have touch. Obviously, that's and that's the key. The, the, the reason they can make them so cheap, there's no touch on this. This is old school up down left right press button. Um, but actually, it's really good. Um, I have become very attached to this phone. I'm thinking of maybe a day a week, like being a vegan for a day a week. I'm thinking of doing this a day a week. Um, I've got Instagram on this. I've got Gmail. I've got, uh, it has Facebook and Twitter. Obviously, I don't have those enabled. Uh, but this is the bit that shocked me. It has a Google Assistant. So if it's got Google Assistant, it can do voice recognition. Now, in the cloud, which is, I know, slightly different. But that's the level it's at. So, and I even went and set up, the development environment is based around the Firefox Web IDE. So all you have to do is get, it's an old version of Firefox, you install that, it's a web app. Uh, you run it through the tool, and, and I made Hello Call for Code, kind of made a Hello World app, and it works. So I'm really pleased about that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I can't call it, I swear. I went in and I changed hello world to hello call for code from KaiOS. Um, Semi-joking, this is shockingly good um, and is well capable of doing everything we described. So therefore, oh, and, and the important thing in terms of market dynamics, KaiOS phones are the second best selling phone now in India after Android. They've, they've, act, they've knocked out um, iOS and by far the best selling phones in, in um, sub Saharan Africa and so on. So that means the next billion who are going online, like there's all 100 million of these in 18 months. It's it, not this specifically, but the Gio phones and so on. It, it, is, it is amazing that, that you can do all of this. And because it is, it's Android, it's, it's web apps, it's, it's bog standard technology. It means, you know, uh, we should be able, for whatever app that's being done, in theory, should be doable uh, on this type of device, and therefore, you know, is the addressable market uh, wider. The mainstream languages thing, that's a much bigger ask. I don't think, you know, that's a developer thing that's going to take the Googles of the world and so on to, to actually say, yeah, we're gonna go more than English, French, German, Dutch, you know, we're gonna have to uh, broaden that base of languages that can be machine translated. Um, and that was it uh, for me. I think. So basically, if you want to go and work on that project, please go sign up and say I want to go work on that project. But more importantly, I'd love, and, and everybody who's involved in Call for Gold would love, if, if you want to go and just you know take all of your skills and apply them to genuine, specific good. And I know a lot of people are involved in open source, and open source is fantastic, and you know, you're doing stuff that benefits people. But you, and in many cases, you don't know who you're benefiting. Whereas if you actually go and work on these projects, you may see uh, who you're benefiting. I'm not going to talk about, there's prize money and everything going on there, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't demean you by, by talking about the 250 grand and the... <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not, I don't know where that, how that money works or anything. I don't know is it for the project, but it's there. Um, and so there are teams being created. It is worldwide. So this is not a, a US-centric thing or a Europe-centric thing. These are teams all over the world who are getting involved in this. Um, you can literally get your thinking cap on. You can take part. You can build whatever you want. Um, it can be software, it can be harder, it can be a combination of both. And, and I know this is a Node.js meetup, but I think one important thing which doesn't necessarily come across uh, on, on a lot of the materials, it doesn't have to be for developers. It can be for you know, uh, technical writers and designers and uh, people who do, do you know, workshops, who can actually pull the team together. You know, <laughs> project managers who can actually pull the thing together and get it shipped and delivered. Product managers who can actually you know, make the thing be exactly what it should be and address the, you know, the problem it, it, it's, it's set up to solve. But I, I think it's a phenomenal um, initiative, I have to say. I was totally unaware of it um, uh, until this happened. Uh, and I'm still buzzing about it, the whole thing. Uh, and I hope uh, all of you get buzzed about it as well. Thanks.